Okay, in this scene, we're going to talk about aspirin, and it's going to be represented by this guy who likes to wear a pin of an ass. See, it's like a pin on his shirt with a picture of an ass on it, like a donkey. Ass pin for aspirin. So remember, in our pharmacology videos, our first room is going to be on method of action, our second room is going to be on clinical use, and our third room is going to be on adverse effects. So here is this guy over here, and he has the ass pin, the ass pin for aspirin. He didn't notice the end that was sad behind him, which reminds us that aspirin is an end sad, because he was standing on these two chickens. We'll call them cocks. A cock is a chicken, so he's standing on these two cocks. This helps us remember that aspirin, being an end sad, inhibits cyclooxygenase. But here we're gonna have it really dramatic. We'll have the cocks exploding. This helps us remember that aspirin is different than the other NSAIDs in that it irreversibly inhibits cyclooxygenase. And it does this by covalent acetylation. Okay, what happens when aspirin inhibits cyclooxygenase? Hey, cool, what's this doing under the room over here? That's kind of random. When the chickens exploded, these things fell through the floor. And this helps us remember that when COX-1 and COX-2 goes down, there's going to be a decreased production of thromb thromboxin A2, represented by the trombone over here, and the P that's glad for prostaglandins. The P that's glad for prostaglandins. And this is because COX-1 and COX-2 are responsible of the conversion from arachidonic acid to the cyclic endoperoxides, which make the prostaglandins and thromboxin. Okay, so since COX-1 and COX-2 exploded, we're going to have a decreased production of the prostaglandins and thromboxane. And this is what leads to the effect of that aspirin has. So let's just make a note of this clock over here that's bloody, that's high. The clock that's bloody, that's high, to help us remember that aspirin leads to increased bleeding time because it inhibits the formation of thromboxane A2, which is involved in aggregation. So blocked aggregation will lead to increased bleeding time. But there's going to be no effect on PT and PTT. And a final point we're going to make before we go to the next room is that the effect of aspirin is going to last until new platelets are formed. Okay, here we go. Clinical use. So if we look at the door over here, there are plates that are separate from each other. They're not aggregating. This helps us remember that at low dose, for example, less than 300 milligrams per day, aspirin leads to decreased platelet aggregation. And that makes sense. It blocks thromboxin A2, which is involved in platelet aggregation. So blocking thromboxin A2 will lead to platelet deaggregation. At an intermediate dose between 300 and 240 milligrams per day, it will have antipyretic and analgesic effects. This guy was not feeling so well. He had a headache. That's why he's on the floor. And he also has a fever. Aspirin at this intermediate dose treats headache and fever. We have this fire over here with lots of medicine falling down on it. Putting out the fire. This helps remember that only at high doses does aspirin serve as an anti-inflammatory. Between 2,400 and 4,000 milligrams per day, which is not really clinically used so often. Okay, now let's talk about adverse effects. Okay, so our third room is going to be on adverse effects. Aspirin and the other NSAIDs have a lot of adverse effects. Let's talk about them. So the first thing you notice, of course, are these bells in his ears, which reminds us of the ringing in the ears, the tinnitus associated with cranial nerve 8. We also note the Pepsi by his stomach to remind us of the peptic ulcers. Pepsi in his stomach for peptic ulcers or the gastric ulcers. This is the most common side effect. And this happens because prostocyclins inhibit gastric secretion. So if we block prostocyclins, that will lead to increased gastric secretion. That's why it's better to take aspirin with food. Then we note his kidney over here in the back exploding. This reminds us of the acute kidney injury and the interstitial nephritis, which is associated with chronic use of aspirin. And this happens because prostaglandins are responsible for maintaining renal blood flow. So if we block the renal blood flow, that will lead to kidney problems. And here's this kid over here with the rays on him, the kid with the rays. This reminds us of Ray syndrome. This happens in children due to salicylic acid excess, and it happens primarily when children are treated with aspirin for viral infection. It's a rapidly worsening brain disease that you could see seizures, vomiting, confusion, and other problems. Look at these nasal polyps on the father over here. In patients with asthma or nasal polyps, aspirin can cause even further allergic reactions. And this happens because, as we mentioned, arachidonic acid can progress either to the leukotrienes or the prostaglandins. So if we block the prostaglandin direction, it will shift to the leukotriene production. Leukotrienes are really not good for asthmatics, as it, it can exacerbate their allergic reactions. Okay, just for sake of completeness, I want to make one final point, and that's that toxic doses of aspirin causes respiratory alkalosis early, but transitions to mixed metabolic acidosis respiratory alkalosis. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this scene on aspirin. Stay tuned for our next video in pharmacology.